going to talk about the comeback. Now, I love comebacks. I love comeback stories. Why do I love comeback stories? I love comeback stories because I love people. I love to celebrate somebody who was going through a tough season. I love to celebrate what God has done in their life when they get to make a comeback, where they were enduring a setback, and now, boom, they had a comeback. Comebacks are fun. And, uh, man, when you think about comebacks, sometimes you can think about um, sports. I mean, sports always have good comeback stories. And so today, I'm going to show you a great comeback, but it's not about the team. It's about the person. When I get, when I get ready for the day, uh, I try to spend time with God. I try to spend time with my family. And if I can eke out five minutes with Sports Center, that feels like a great way to start the day right there. Well, I just happened to kick on the tube at the right time, and they were telling a story of a phenomenal comeback. His name is, is uh, Andre, Andre Ingram. Andre Ingram has had a dream of being in the NBA ever since he was this tall. Well, let's just check out Andre's story. I had to move the exit meeting up to today because uh, the LA Lakers want to call you up <laughs> and sign you for the rest of the season. I wonder why those two big guys are back here. Wow. Wow. Congratulations, man. Thank you. Welcome to I appreciate the that. I appreciate yeah. that. Thank you, Mo. Here comes Andre Ingram. What a nice applause. 32-year-old Andre Ingram never played in the NBA. Ingram with a shot. 32 years old. First NBA game over 380 games in the minor leagues. And he gets another look for three. Here comes Ingram, he goes by. It's a nice runner from two, and he's fouled. Ingram, pretty good! With his wife and two young daughters watching his first NBA game, Andre Ingram, a night he will never forget. Dude, that was awesome. That was one of those comeback stories that about got me choked up. Now, I like to cry anyway, but that one, man, that one almost got me when I'm watching that because here's a guy whose entire life has been dreaming about playing in the NBA, and he finally gets his chance, and he's a 32-year-old rookie. 32-year-old rookie, that doesn't happen in the NBA. Man, what a comeback. And his comeback is against the number one team in the Western Conference, the Houston Rockets. He is playing against James Harden. He's playing against Chris Paul. And as a 32-year-old rookie, he goes off for 19 points. There's guys that play their entire career that don't score 19 points in an NBA game. I was like, this is awesome. And I'll tell you what makes it so awesome. I'll tell you what makes his comeback so awesome is to know how hard his setback had to be. He's 32 years old and he finally made it. He's been dreaming about that since he was that tall. When you stand behind like the subwoofers and the speakers, it's hard to hear. I don't know if you, I don't know if you guys caught this. He had been in a developmental league for 10 years. He never gave up. Do you see how that video started when he was in a conference room? Do you know how many conference rooms in 10 years like that with that GM he's been invited into? And for 10 years, he's been told, hey, you've either been traded or you've been cut or, you know, this year they're not calling you back. Like stepping into that room is stepping into setback after setback after setback. And here that guy calls him into the room. What do you think Andre is thinking? Here comes another setback. To put ourselves in his shoes, he's like, I'm going to have to go home. I'm going to have to tell my family, no, I either got cut or, hey, they, they, I either got cut or I got traded or, hey, you know, here's how this thing's going to go. He was, he was set up for a setback. But because that guy never gave up, because in the face of setback after setback after setback, he still had the courage to walk into that room. Can you imagine how good that comeback felt when that general manager said, the Lakers wanted to pick up your contract? Now, you may not know anything about basketball, and that's okay. 
The L.A. Lakers are the showtime of basketball. Magic Johnson was in that room and saying, dude, I want you on my team. If that guy never plays another game again, I think his basketball career has been successful, don't you? What a comeback. And man, like you, you guys, comebacks are so fun to talk about. And I know that like the series name is Comeback because we're going to talk about comebacks because they're fun. Today we're going to talk about the dynamic of a comeback. And we're going to start our conversation in something a little bit uncomfortable. Because if you just talk about the comeback, you have seriously shortchanged the power of, uh, of what God has done. Because before there was a comeback, you had to experience a setback. And nobody's really out there saying, hey, let me tell you about my setback. Hey, can I tell you the time the wheels just came off my life? I mean, we don't get that amped up about those stories, do we? No, man, we weep and we turn red and we go inward. And these aren't things that we want to share. But if we're going to talk about a comeback, then we need to start our conversation with a setback. And I would dare say with this many people in the room, you've all experienced some type of setbacks in your life. You know, I remember getting married. I remember our wedding day. It was like, oh, this is awesome. And it's just always going to feel this way until I screwed it up and it didn't. We experience setbacks with the people that we love, right? I remember thinking, man, I can't wait to have kids. It is going to be so much fun to have kids. Have kids, they said. It would be fun, they said. (laughs) Have more kids, they said. It'd be more fun. So we did. Man, we've had some setbacks as a dad. But God teaches me things through my kids so I can have a comeback. You see, we've all experienced setbacks in our lives. Some of you guys might be in the middle of a setback right now. Maybe, maybe there's somebody here today who's single and you're ready to mingle. But mingling hasn't come easy for you. Like you had hopes and dreams of being somebody's spouse and it hasn't happened yet and it feels like a setback and you're wondering what's wrong with me because you just want to be loved by somebody else and that's where you are today. You feel like I'm in a relational setback. But maybe your relational setback would be a little bit more uh, serious in nature than even that one. Maybe your setback is you've got, fit, you've got decades of family dysfunction and you are trying like crazy to crawl out of that thing so that your family can have a better reality and a better future than the one that you had. That you can have better experiences. And as hard as you try, it just feels like you're always failing and you're just not getting there. And what I want to tell you is, listen, keep fighting. Keep fighting if that's your setback. Maybe your setbacks this morning are financial in nature and they're not relational. Maybe, maybe there's like a, a, young, like a young man or a young, uh, a young woman. You've gone to school, you're going to school and you want this or, or you're going to trade school or you got hopes and dreams of a particular uh, career path and it's not coming together like you wished and you hoped and you thought it would. You just find yourself in a season of a setback. Or maybe you got that job that you dreamed of and you love it and they told you recently that, man, you can do that job. You just can't do it here anymore. And you find yourself in a setback. Maybe you lost somebody that you loved this year. And you find yourself in the middle of a setback. Those are things we don't like to talk about. And you want to know the one place that it, more than any other place, that it's really awkward in the place that we don't want to talk about our setbacks? It's here in church because we're supposed to have it all together, right? We're supposed to be happy all the time. We're in church. We're supposed to have it all together. We're setbacks. It gets hard to talk about setbacks at church because we're supposed to have it all together. And if you feel that way this morning, what I want to remind you is this, and I love to say this because this sets me free more than anybody that I, you know, and I'm just thinking about how it sets me free. We're all imperfect people here pursuing a perfect God. I am imperfect. Don't believe me? Ask my family. But you don't even have to ask them. I just told you, I'm flawed. And I want to tell you something. God loves you. 
He knows all my flaws, and he still loves me. He knows all your flaws, and he still loves you. How good is that? Like, his love for you isn't based on your performance. So it's okay to talk about our setbacks. Because eventually, he wants to lead us to a comeback. But church can be a really hard place to talk about setbacks. And if I'm just going to be really honest, you want to know why it's hard to talk about setbacks here? Because we're so stinking judgmental. Christians are judgmental. Jesus had this awesome line, if you're a follower of Jesus, Mike Fackler, you're a follower of Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus this morning, do you remember what Jesus said when it came to judging others? He said, get the plank out of your own eye so you can see the, the what? Grab the plank. That's a two-handed endeavor out of your eye so that you might be able to see the speck. In your brother's eye. The reason we don't like to talk about it is because we feel judged. And I want to let you know is that, man, I've been here for five years. And if you're a guest with us today, I would tell you that this is not a group of perfect people. I am not a perfect pastor. We're all imperfect people running after a perfect God who loves us. And we won't always get it right, but we will be here for you. And that God doesn't want you to have to carry your stuff, go through your setback alone. And so I want to invite you to be a part of a community group. One of the things that I always like to ask is, who in your life do you have that you could talk to about the setbacks? And I would dare say, if everybody in here is in a community group or on their way to a community group and you can get in one, I bet even if you're not in a community group, you probably have at least one person that you can share your setbacks with. But the real question is, are you? You see, we all want the comeback. But what we forget is we don't have to shoulder the setback by ourselves. God loves us so much that he gave us his son. And he's given us one another to endure that setback. So here's my challenge when it comes to this. If you're in a community group, create a safe place where people can share their setbacks. And if you're walking through a setback, I'm going to challenge you because it's really hard. And men, especially for us, we don't want to share this stuff. If God has blessed you with a good friend, I'm going to ask you to share with that friend the setback that you're going through. Because if that friend loves you and that friend loves you, they'll help you with your comeback. But you see, we can't just talk about comebacks and we're like, oh, comebacks feel so good. When in reality, we find ourselves in the middle of a setback. And if we're in the middle of a setback, we just got to be true to that. And we've got to talk about that too, right? So we're going to build this series. And like I said, today we're going to talk about the dynamic of a comeback. So we're just going to talk about the dynamics of a comeback today. And next week, we're going to put some real handles on that. But we're going to, wait, 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 uh, I can talk. <laughs> What I want you to do is I want you to turn in your Bibles to Micah chapter 7, verse 8. And we're going to build this thing around this whole idea right here. Micah 7, verse 8. It's going to come up on your screen, but this is so good. You should, man, if you have your Bibles, look at it in your Bibles. Uh, if you have your, your U version on your phone or tablet, look at it there. But it's Micah 7, verse 8, and it says, don't gloat over me, my enemy. Don't gloat over me, my enemy. Do you think that Andre Ingram probably had some people gloat over him when he didn't make it year and year again? Do you think he probably had a voice in his head that was telling him he was a failure? You think he had that? I bet he did. Have you ever fallen? Have you ever had a misstep? Have you ever had a setback and felt like there was somebody there to gloat over you? Have you guys ever experienced that before? I have. Don't gloat over me, my enemy couple things I want to just say there. The first one is, is the person who gloats over you isn't your enemy. The devil's your enemy. In fact, God gives him a name beyond Lucifer, beyond Satan, beyond the devil. He's known as a Christian and God's enemy. And he's the one that gloats over you when you're not failing. And man, when somebody gloats over you when you have a setback, don't you just want to prove them wrong? Don't you want to stand back up and prove them wrong? Isn't that the first thing you want to do? Is that what you want to do? 
Maybe not? Okay, that's what I want to do. We want to stand up and we want to prove them wrong. I would just ask you to, if that's you, I would ask you to throw that whole thing out. And just be the you that God created you to be. And I would ask you to do something. You see, the enemy is actually the devil. And if you want to hate somebody, hate him. But I want to put some real handles on how you can hate him. Is pray for the one who's gloating over you. Now, when we pray for the person gloating over us, like, dear Lord, if they have to trip today and bang their head on the concrete, I'm okay with that. <laughs> Lord, if they have the most embarrassing moment in their life happen today, please let me see it. <laughs> this isn't going to feel very Christian to you, but it is Christian. I love the book of Psalms. And I don't love it because it's pretty, but do I think it's pretty? One of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 91. I absolutely love it. But what my favorite part about Psalms is, is David's just really real. For the people that gloat over him, he prays for him that the Lord would kill him. <laughs> like, Lord, you know who my enemy is. If you just want to wipe them from the face of the earth today, that would be awesome. But what you can do is if you pray for your enemy, don't pray for them in that vein. Pray for them, say, Lord, this is how I feel, but would you be with them today? And God will do a changing work in your life. See, don't gloat over me, my enemy. And it always feels like every time there's a setback in our lives that there's somebody there to gloat over us, isn't there? It just always feels that way. And it says, though I have fallen, everybody falls before they can walk. You go through scripture, and we'll look at that in a minute, all the people that we love and we celebrate and we try to model our lives after, what we have to remember is they weren't perfect. They were running after a perfect God, and they all fell before they could walk. They all endured before they could celebrate. Though I have fallen, this is just acknowledging I'm in the middle of a setback. He says, I will rise. Though I set in darkness, the Lord will be my. Though I'm in the middle of a setback, the Lord will be my. Though my life is shrouded and clouded in darkness, the Lord is my. Man, even though I don't want to be here, and even though this setback stinks, even though I want this comeback, even in the middle of this, the Lord is my. The Lord is my light. The big idea that we want you to take away from this series, the big idea that we want you to take away, if I haven't said this already, is this. For every setback, there is a comeback. For every setback, there is a comeback. Even when you're sitting in darkness, there can be a comeback. Even if your setback is bigger and deeper and darker than you ever thought, what I want to let you know is that a comeback is possible. You might have to endure the rest of your life, but I want to let you know that even if you had to endure, there's a comeback possible. That even as you sit in darkness, a comeback is possible, not in your strength, but in the one who made you strength, the Lord God Almighty. He can give you his strength. He can give you his peace. He wants to share his love with you. So even in the midst of a setback, you can experience a comeback because God has made a way. You see, there is one who is the author of comebacks. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. His name is the great I am. He is the alpha and the omega. He is the God of comebacks. And we work so hard, and I bet this morning you work really hard, or, or maybe you're in the process of working really hard right now, I don't know. But we work so hard to get our way to God, like, Lord, help me think a godly thought. Lord, I want to be closer to you. And we're trying to get vertical with him, and we're trying to get closer, but we can't jump high enough. We can't think clear enough. We cannot get there. And if that's how you feel this morning, I want to remind you of a really important thing that God did for us in his great love. It was the start of the greatest setback and comeback we've ever known. You see, God knew that we couldn't jump high enough or we couldn't do anything high enough, so he came down to us. He came down to us and he endured absolutely everything that we would ever face. And he did that on our behalf. And he came and he bound up our wounds and he healed our illnesses and he pointed us towards the gospel. He pointed us towards the love of the Father. He revealed who he was. And what did we give him for it? We shouted, crucify him. You see, it looked like a major setback. 
the Pharisees were rejoicing as Jesus Christ hung on the cross. But in the midst of that setback, Jesus gave us a foreshadowing of what was to come because he whispered, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And three days later, as dawn broke and an angel of the Lord shot from heaven to earth and he rolled the stone away, Jesus Christ walked out of the tomb, victor over sin and death. The greatest comeback ever. Not for his own good, but for our benefit. Because he overcame, we can overcome. Because we've been set back, we can have a comeback because of Jesus. You see, God is a God of comebacks. If you look in the Old Testament, you look at Moses. Moses had to endure a comeback or a setback before he endured a comeback. You see, one day he's, he, he, he survived a holocaust, a genocide, and then he grows up in the Pharaoh's home and he knows that he's not Egyptian uh, by birthright. And he sees his people, the Israelite people, the Hebrew people being beaten and afflicted. And so in, in an act of rage, in an act of liberation and desperation, he kills an Egyptian guard and he has to flee for the wilderness. And Moses' setback was one of an identity issue. You see, he thought it was his job to free God's people when it was God's job to free his people. See, Moses had to go through an identity crisis. He had to go through an identity issue to go through and endure a setback in order to have a comeback. If you go throughout scripture, you can read about a judge and his name was Samson. Now, oftentimes when we talk about Samson, we talk about how there was just like some sexual immorality. There was sexual sin going on. But I want to tell you that, that Samson's sexual sin was just a symptom of what was really going on. Is Samson had a divided heart. You see, Samson wanted to live for himself, and when God was ready, or when not, not when he was ready, but when God wanted to use him, Samson's like, okay, I guess I got a few minutes here, and then Samson's like, okay, Lord, use me. But more often than not, Samson wanted to live for himself, and occasionally he would live for God, and that was the cause of his setback, and he had to endure a setback before he could have a comeback. You think about You think about Esther, Queen Esther in the Old Testament. Wow. Like every young lady, she grew up wanting to be a princess and a queen. And one day God made it possible. And she wound up in this palace. And not just any palace, but the best palace on the planet. The palace with King Xerxes. And she's like, I am a queen. I am somebody's queen. This is awesome. Until she learned that one of the king's best friends wanted to wipe out all the Jews. He wanted to exterminate them. And she understood that she was a Jew living in the palace. And she began to freak out. And fear began to reach into her life. And it was fear that set Esther back. And she had to endure a setback before she could endure a comeback. And if you look at these people's lives, it is often fear. It is often a lack of identity. And it is often a divided heart that causes the setbacks in our lives. And I want to remind you That for every setback, there is a comeback. And God wants to help lead you from your setback to your comeback. But there's some things that he wants to show you. So today I'm just going to share a few things about the dynamic of a comeback. And next week we'll really put some flesh on this thing. But there is something that a setback and a comeback shares in common. And what they both share in common is this little thing called momentum. Here's my definition of momentum taken from somebody else's, but just my spin on it. Momentum is forward progress uniquely affected by the decisions we make and the circumstances we face. There are some decisions that you make that lead you in a certain direction, and when those decisions stack up on top of one another, or these circumstances stack up on top of one another, they move you forward in a direction. It is forward progress. But on your outlines, you will see that momentum can be forward progress in a positive or negative direction. Now, you know when you have momentum in your favor because it feels like every decision that you make leads to something bigger, it leads to something better, it leads to something more rewarding, fulfilling, and we all love those seasons in our lives. It feels so good because momentum is on our side. 
But we also know those moments when it doesn't matter what decision we make, it feels like it just leads to setback after setback after setback. And the wind is in our face. And what do we like to say? Man, I took one step forward, but it always feels like I'm taking two or three steps back. That's when just momentum, whether it's decisions we're making or events that are, are not our fault, just keep happening in our lives and move us forward in a positive or negative direction. And while you physically, while we physically cannot see momentum, we can see the effects of it. Now for you sports fans, when you're watching sports, you can see the tangible results of momentum. When a team believes that they're better, when a team believes that together they can succeed, you will see that team begin to perform better. You can see it. They get, what they like to say on TV is they've got momentum on their side. Now, being a Detroit Lions fan, that is rarely ever said of my team. In fact, you can see the tangible results of momentum in a negative way, and you love playing the Lions because you're going to see it all game long for four quarters except for maybe the last two minutes when they give you a little bit of hope. But no matter what happens, that defense cannot stop the offense. It's just negative momentum stacking up. You see it in sports all the time, but you also see it in businesses. If you look around our city, you know the businesses that have momentum. You know the businesses that have the momentum. I mean, I could just rattle off a whole bunch, but I'd leave somebody out and I'd offend somebody. I don't want to do that. But there are some of you in here who are really successful at what you do with your businesses and you have momentum. But you can also drive through the same city and you can see abandoned buildings or warehouses where you can see the negative effects of momentum stacked up on them and they're no longer in businesses. But see, momentum impacts churches too. It can have positive effect. Woo, we got a brand new senior pastor. It's going to be awesome. And then he comes in and changes at least a third of what we used to do. What's going on? And you see the swing of momentum. I know we've never had to go through anything like that five years ago. We can't see momentum, but we can feel the same thing in our own personal lives. When we feel it in our back, we feel it. Momentum, it's a dynamic of both a setback and a comeback. Today I want to define a setback as this. A setback is momentum heading in the wrong direction. You know those mornings. Your dog's so happy to see you, but he's just happy to see you at the wrong time. Because you have a bowl full of Cheerios. And he didn't just want to say hello. He jumped up in your lap and the Cheerios went all over to you. That's okay. You have a little extra time. So you go and change and you go to start the car. But the battery's dead. Mm. You're late to the meeting. You missed the sale. And on top of that, you used the wrong restroom and everybody was there to see that happen too. <laughs> Setback. It's just like it's momentum heading in a negative direction. Is heading in the wrong direction. And enduring setbacks is just part of a life. And here's what I want to let us know. There are some emotions that are associated with setbacks. And you don't really need me to articulate them, but I'm going to. When we're in the midst of a setback, this is how we feel. We feel like we're sinking or we feel like we're slogging around in mud, like we just can't you know, get any traction, we can't get moving. There's feelings of desperation. There's feelings of isolation. And it's really just a feeling of death. She so I want to get moving, and if you find yourself there today, what I want to remind you is, is that for every setback, there's a comeback. But let me just offer one of two reasons that maybe you're in a setback. Because setbacks aren't all bad. God can actually use setbacks to be good. So if you're in a setback this morning, one of the questions I would want you to ask are, are you in a setback because you're looking for satisfaction in something that can't offer satisfaction? You see, God can offer satisfaction. He can offer love. He can offer life. He can offer peace. But are you experiencing a setback because you're looking for, for the things of God in something other than God? Is, could that be the reason for a setback? Or how's your work habits? Now, I know with this group right here, there's a lot of hardworking people here today. And sometimes we get so consumed with our work that we work, 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 and we're just tired. 
could your setback be because you've just been going too hard and you just need to stop and rest? And that's what I mean. Listen, setbacks aren't bad. Sometimes God allows us to experience setbacks when we're working hard, 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 because we're working and we're looking at the wrong things. And he wants us to look and he wants us to turn to him. You see, every setback we make can be traced to these two reasons. They're either, they're either self-inflicted or they're unforeseen, which means my setbacks that I faced could be self-induced. Like I made a series of bad choices, and I might even know that they were bad. I just wanted to be selfish. I wanted to make things about me. Have you ever done that before? I have. And we get this momentum heading in the wrong way because we're selfish and sinful and we just got our eyes on the wrong thing and we can do these things to us. But there are also those moments where things are unforeseen, where unforeseen circumstances come into our lives and they set us back. It's either self-induced or it's unforeseen. And these events and these circumstances stack up on us and can get momentum heading in the wrong direction. But again, I want to remind you that for every setback, there's a comeback. And every comeback has to begin with a setback. Recently, I told you a couple weeks ago that I was in Lebanon. And uh, when you are on a plane for that long, like sitting in those seats is not good. But you get to watch a whole lot of movies. From, from Dulles, Washington Airport to wherever I landed on the other side of the pond, I got three and a half movies in. And I know that there's longer flights than that. And that's why I don't go on them, because they scare me to death. But I got to watch three and a half movies, and one of the movies I watched on the plane was a movie that you may have seen before, probably one you loved. It was called The Darkest Hour, story of Winston Churchill. And at the very end of the movie, they pulled up a quote that I absolutely loved. And here's a quote that Winston Churchill said back in the day. He said this, and I, and I believe it's on your outline. And I don't, there, here it is. Success is not final. That is a true statement. You see, success today wants to lie to you. When you experience a little bit of success, what, does, what do you want to believe? That you've arrived. You're like, I've arrived. Woo, I made it. That it's final. Success is not final. But then he goes on to say that failure is not fatal. But it sure feels that way, doesn't it? Doesn't it feel that way when we have setbacks? feels like that failure is fatal. But it's not. He's got a great perspective. And then I love how he says, he just finishes up by saying, it's the courage to continue that counts. What I took away from that quote that day was that for every success, there was first a failure. It was success that didn't last. And for every setback, there's a comeback. So let's talk about the dynamics of a comeback for just a minute. And here they are. Here we go. A comeback is, moment, is momentum headed in the right direction. And I would tell you that this, for every, or sorry, every comeback starts with a turning point. Every comeback starts with a turning point. If you're in the middle of a setback, there needs to be a pivot point. There needs to be a turning point because for every setback, there can be a comeback. And every comeback begins with a turning point where you say, this is not forever. This is not, rea this is not my forever reality. There is hope. The second dynamic of a comeback is comebacks don't happen overnight. They happen over time. We want comebacks to happen right away, but they don't. Setbacks happen in a moment. Comebacks take time. I would also let you know we have community groups and we have Celebrate Recovery that will walk with you over this period of time. The third and final dynamic of a comeback is this. Foundational principle. Behind every comeback, behind every comeback story is a loving God who made a way for you to come back. Behind your comeback story is a loving God who made a way back for you. Today, if you find yourself in the middle of a setback, your turning point is to turn towards God. If you're a guest here and you're just here checking out the church and you're far from God and you find yourself in a setback, what I would tell you is don't turn to drugs, don't turn to alcohol, don't turn to another flawed person to just depend on them to get you out. Turn to God first. The second step in that is just understand it's going to take time. Jesus invites us to follow him. That is not something that's done in a second. That is a lifelong commitment of walking with him. But you see, when he's leading and you're following, 
It is his love that's going to lead you to a comeback. And I want to let you know that your turning point, if you turn to God, he will take your setback and he'll turn it into a comeback that you can celebrate. But what if I would give you this challenge? This is going back to the beginning where we're creating safe places. God has walked us through setbacks. He's allowed us to experience comebacks on purpose so that we can help other people who have setbacks experience a comeback. There are people in your life that need to know your story because God walked you through and you can, he has put you in their lives to help them walk through it. Just be vulnerable enough and real enough and non-judgmental enough and loving enough to share that comeback with somebody else. I'll close with this. Next week, you will not want to miss it. There are some foundational things in our lives where we all experience setbacks. As a Christian, I thought I was going to give my life to Jesus way back when, and it would just be an upward trajectory till he called me home. Is that reality? My reality is I've gone like, and I've had to start over again. That's my reality. There's some setbacks that we all, that are, that are universal, that every follower of Jesus experiences in their life when it comes to their faith and their trust and their belief. But what's nuts is there's some things that we do that brings us to those points. And I'm going to share you a scary point in the scripture where we're all going to see ourselves that brought the nation of Israel to that point, this, this just catastrophic setback. But at the end of that, I'm going to show you in the same pivot point, this turning point, where a beautiful thing happened and God led them to an amazing comeback and it's something we can learn from. I hope you'll join us for it. I hope you'll tell your friends about it. Lord God, thanks for a chance to meet. Thanks for a chance to um, share your love. God, I want to say thank you for being light in the dark places of our hearts and our minds. God, if we're making some choices that are honoring you, that are setting us back. Holy Spirit, convict us, I pray. Surround us with your loving people. Holy Spirit, speak and lead us to the comeback that you want us to have. In Jesus' name, amen.